God has designed light in such a way that light is the brightest when contrasted against the darkness. And in a time of great darkness and despair, God speaks to the prophet Isaiah to encourage the people concerning the future. And his article of encouragement does not specifically deal with the trials and challenges of their day. The article of encouragement does not speak hope and, and better days are coming as it relates to their circumstantial events. God chooses this time to encourage the people by telling them about Jesus. He begins the prophecy with a word that encapsulates much of the work of Jesus. He begins the prophecy in verse 1 with the word nevertheless. If you wanted a word to pair with Jesus that would help you understand his mission and his ministry toward us, it would be the word nevertheless. Humanity had hawked our souls into the pawn shop of sin, death, hell, and the grave, but nevertheless, Jesus came. When we were lost, nevertheless, Jesus came and he found us. When we were broken, nevertheless, Jesus came and he began to put us back together again. This is Jesus. He is the God of nevertheless moments. He's the God of nevertheless blessings. He's the God of nevertheless breakthroughs. And in spite of, that's what nevertheless means, in spite of, it, it connotes a positive outcome breaking through in spite of negative threats and circumstances. And I want to tell you, there's a nevertheless blessing over your head right now this morning no matter what it looks like no matter how you feel no matter how down you are no matter how sick you are no matter how depressed you are no matter how anxious you are there is a nevertheless blessing and breakthrough over your head right now somebody say this is Jesus <clears throat> To understand the circumstances that the people were living in, we have to go to Isaiah 8, chapter 20, or chapter 8, verse 21 and 22, and it describes their condition. It calls them hard pressed and hungry, and, and it says they're enraged and that they're cursing and that they look upward and they see trouble and they see darkness and they see gloom of anguish. Look at that in verse 22. You see trouble and you see darkness and gloom of anguish. And so it is into these circumstances that God sends the prophecy of Jesus. Because when you get something in the human experience that's really, really, really dark, there's, there's no hope, there's no brightness, there's no clear way to see your way out. The only answer, the most powerful thing God has when situations are hopeless is he has Jesus. To anyone in a hopeless situation. This is Jesus. He brings light to the darkest, most despairing, hopeless situations. This is the power of Jesus. There is reason to hope. There is reason to have joy. And there is reason to willfully, by volition of your own will, put away gloom. Gloom tends to abound this time of year. Spirits of oppression come upon people to bring gloom to people, to bring people's minds low and their faith low and their expectation low, but to the gloom of darkness and despair, God sends today what he sent all the way back there. He sent a word about Jesus and the power of the word of Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The power of Jesus is here push somebody and say this is Jesus and then he begins to to prophesy a divine reversal of circumstances now we hear that preached in church a lot especially charismatic churches especially non-denominational churches we hear what I call the happy gospel a lot but but the happy gospel that you hear a lot of places it leaves out the foundational piece 
the foundation for all of our blessing, the foundation for all of our encouragement, the foundation for all of our joy isn't just principles for living, isn't just principles for success that we can pull out of the word of God. The foundation for all of those things that give us the hope and the joy to look forward to a bright future is Jesus. The foundation that things are going to get better is Jesus. The foundation that your body's going to be healed is Jesus. The foundation that your mind's going to recover is Jesus and and he brings in Jesus prophesying about them and and he says in in the past the land of Zebulon has been humbled it's been lightly esteemed it's just been it's been brought low but then he says that God is going to raise it up he's going to favor it he's going to glorify it and and we have to understand that the Babylonians Years before, centuries before this was written, the Babylonians had come and sieged the nation of Israel and they wanted to destroy it. But they didn't just want to siege the nation and destroy the walls and destroy the temples. They wanted to destroy the very race of the Jews. And so they did this by deporting them. Interestingly enough, Hitler did the same thing. It wasn't just the death camps and the gas chambers. He also uh, deported them. He scattered them all over the earth. The strategy behind this is so they would uh, marry people of other races and their, the blood of their race would become diluted. And over time, they would eradicate the Jewish race from the face of the earth. So when Babylon came in and they deported all the Jews, they started repopulating the nation with Gentiles, people from the borders of the country. And Gentile just is any, any race that's not a Jew. So there was everything there. And they were filling the land up with people that were not Jews. And so uh, when Babylon fell hundreds of years later, the Jews begin to make their way back to their homeland and begin to repopulate the nation of Israel. And the whole nation was repopulated and reclaimed and repatriated except this one little piece of land called Galilee. So the word Galilee literally means circle of Gentiles. So in all of the land, you've got uh, Jews back uh, in power. You've got Jews back in their homeland, except this one little swath of, of territory called Galilee, which is the circle of Gentiles. And as a result, this piece of land and the people that inhabited it were hated. They were looked down on. They were seen as less than. Galilee was known as a ghetto and as a dump. Galilee was rejected. Galilee was despised. And Galilee was a dark place. That's why he says in Isaiah 9 two, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Why is that? It's a function of God's grace. They didn't deserve the light, but the light just dawned on them anyway. This is a picture of God's grace for us. It's like if, when you go outside, when the sun shines on you, you didn't, make any, you didn't do anything to make it shine on you. You didn't do anything to bring the sun up. It just came up and shined on you. That's how God's grace works. You didn't do anything to deserve the grace of God. You didn't do anything to earn the grace of God. You didn't do anything to garner the favor of God. It just shined on you by grace. And as a result of God's grace, Galilee, this dump, this hated place, is going to experience a divine reversal of circumstances. Say that with me. A divine reversal of circumstances. One more time. A divine, that means God directed, reversal of circumstances. I can't move. I got to say it one more time. A divine reversal of circumstances. It's coming to your life. It's coming to your family because this is Jesus. It's what Jesus does. Listen to what Jesus did for Galilee. Galilee is seen as this terrible, miserable place. And yet, all of the 12 disciples of Jesus were called in Galilee. The first miracle Jesus ever performed, turning water into wine, happened in Cana of Galilee. In fact, the most despised place in the land, Galilee, 
witnessed the most miracles that Jesus performed. Now, Jerusalem, where all the elites were, they rejected Jesus. They made fun of Jesus. They mocked Jesus. They didn't feel lost, so they didn't think they needed a good shepherd to come and find them. But the weak and the broken in Galilee craved his presence. And when you hunger and thirst after the presence of Jesus, not after the presence of politics, not after the presence of just churchianity, but when you hunger and thirst for the presence of the real Jesus, you will will be filled because this is Jesus. It's what Jesus does. He seeks out the lowest. He seeks out the people who have been humiliated by life. He seeks out people who have been planted in negative environments and he comes to show his power to them. It is in Galilee that Jesus will reveal that he is in fact the shepherd of the shattered. It is in Galilee that Jesus will reveal that he is a friend of sin. It is in Galilee that Jesus will prove he is a father to the fatherless. He's near to the brokenhearted, and he still turns dark situations into nevertheless turnarounds because this is Jesus. Push somebody and say, this is Jesus. Verse number three, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy one way or another at some time or another if you are a believer in Jesus if you have accepted Jesus at some point during your walk with God a tidal wave of supernatural joy will wash over your life and there's something about this joy that you need to know the joy that comes from Jesus the joy that comes from Jesus is not circumstantial The joy that comes from Jesus is not dependent upon what's happening in your life. The joy that comes from Jesus is a supernatural joy. It's a joy that the world didn't give. And because the world wasn't the source of it, the world cannot rob you of it. This joy that comes from this Jesus is a joy that will come on you during seasons of your life when you should be crying during seasons of your life when you should be miserable during seasons of your life when you should be depressed during seasons of your life when you're under attack all of a sudden when your head should be low here comes a tidal wave of the joy of the Lord a joy that doesn't have its source in the natural world a joy that isn't dependent on other people a joy that doesn't care how much money is in the bank a joy that doesn't care what odds are against you this joy is from this this Jesus and and then he says that he will break the rod and the bars of the oppressor Jesus is by nature and definition a deliverer don't leave him in a shrine with a candle and a statue don't leave him on the cross in your paintings and around your neck Jesus is a liberator Jesus never met somebody in the scripture that was demon possessed and being attacked by the devil that he did not immediately deliver them and throw the evil spirits out of them for those of you that are under attack and you're wondering if it's God's will for you to get free I came to tell you deliverance this is Sheol breakthrough this is Jesus the removal of oppression this is Jesus no weapon that is formed against you will be able to prosper this is give him praise in the house right now clap your hands clap your hands this is this is say it with me this is this is Jesus this is Jesus verse 5 he said the soldiers shoes their sandals their boots and their garments that were rolled in blood for the purpose of battle he said they're not going to be needed anymore in fact they're going to become fuel for your fire why is he telling them to get rid of all of their battle dress 
Why is he telling them to get rid of what they shod their feet with when they prepare to go out and fight a war? It's because when this Jesus comes, you don't hear what I'm saying. He's prophesying about what it's going to be like when Jesus comes. He said you're not going to need battle dress anymore when Jesus comes. Because when Jesus comes, this battle is not yours. It belongs to God. God, the entrance of Jesus means the exit of my life from battle. The entrance of Jesus means I don't have to fight for myself. The entrance of Jesus means I'm not in a fight with the devil. If the devil attacks me, he's in a fight with God because the battle belongs. Oh, God. I said the battle. I'm starting to feel it up here. I said the battle. In the New Testament, Christians, Ron, are only told to fight one fight. I'm going to preach this saying whether you like it or not. I said in the New Testament, Sandy, we're only told as Christians to fight one fight. We're not told to fight the devil. We are told to fight the good fight of faith. So I'm here this morning going through hell, but I'm here to build my faith. I'm here, may not feel good, may not look good, but I'm here to build my faith because if I will fight the good fight of faith and whatever is attacking me, God will fight on my behalf. Whatever is attacking you, whatever is coming against your family, whatever is coming against your children, whatever it is, You don't hear me. I said, whatever it is. He'll fight it. Why? This is Jesus. This is Jesus. Verse 6. For unto us a child. First he talked about it's going to happen. Now he's telling us in great prophetic detail how it's going to happen. Okay. First the what. Come on, say it with me. First the what. Then the, then the how. He said, unto us a child is, is born. What's the significance that he was born? Well, sin, according to Romans 5, sin entered the world through one disobedient action. God had given mankind at the time a law. Mankind broke it. So through one disobedient action, sin entered. That's how it entered. That's not how it spread. Once it entered the world through disobedience, now it spreads by birth. Adam and Eve were created in purity, but Cain and Abel were born in sin. And every person born since them including your fancy self and mine. We are all born in sin. So birth is how the poison spreads. So God chose the same delivery method that spreads the poison to send the antidote through. He said, if the poison comes through the birth canal, I'm going to make sure the antidote does too. And unto us, unto us ungodly, unto us sinners, unto us broken people, unto us a child is is born. By being born like us, he was able to take on our curse of sin and death. By being born like us, now he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. By being born like us, he extends to us the opportunity to be born again in him. Unto us a child is born. Next, unto us a son is given. You must understand this. Get it straight in your theology. Jesus is a gift. Oh, I thought I'd get somebody to say hallelujah on that. Jesus is a gift. Christianity is not a religion where you climb a moral ladder 
or you climb a ladder of enlightenment and come to an increasing awareness of life and, and become more like God. No, no, no. Christianity is, is a gift that God gives you. The Christ life is a gift that God gives you. Jesus is a gift. His work on Calvary was a gift. And then the Bible says after Jesus ascended that he sent somebody called the Holy Spirit. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And you shall receive, watch, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Everything about Jesus is a gift. Jesus is a gift giver. As he was ascending, Ephesians 4 said, he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Jesus is a gift, and he's still giving gifts. Grace is a gift. Healing is a gift. Mercy is a gift. Wisdom is a gift. He's a gift giver. Lift up your hands and say, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. And then verse 6 continues and says, His name shall be called. Say it with me. His name shall be called. Now, everybody quickly goes to wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Those aren't five names people are going to call him. Hello, wonderful. Hello, counselor. Hello, mighty God. Hello, everlasting father. Hello, prince of peace. No, no, no. He said they're going to say these things about his name. In other words, they're going to hear his name and they're going to say wonderful. They're going to hear his name and they're going to say counselor. They're going to hear his name. They're going to say mighty God. They're going to hear his name and say everlasting father. They're going to hear his name and say prince of peace. Somebody say this is Jesus. God designed the name of Jesus. Listen to me. Not simply to identify him. Look at the screen. But to. Did you know the name of Jesus is not for Jesus? I said, did you know the name of Jesus is not for Jesus? The name of Jesus is so you have something to call. <laughs> Let me prove that to you. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. I want you to look at this language. God wanted to give us a name we could call that activates spiritual power when we call it in faith. But look at what Acts 4 says about it. Nor is there salvation. In any other glory to Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven. No other name. No other name under heaven. Under heaven. Under heaven. There's been no other name under heaven that's been given. The name of Jesus was given to you so you would have something you could call on. Whereby we must be saved look at this there's only three places in the scripture that the scripture says the exact same thing all three times look at romans 10 13 look at it look at the power of his name look at the power of his name how powerful is his name look at it for let that scripture sit on you whoever whoever no matter what condition they're in whoever no matter what background no matter what they've been through no matter what they're in right now whoever calls on the name of the lord shall be saved look at acts chapter 2 verse 21 and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the lord shall be saved look at joel 2 32 and it shall come to pass that Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and they, he, he, was, he was telling them in Isaiah, this is all prophetic about Jesus. He was telling them the name's going to be so powerful that once people encounter the power in it, they'll start saying stuff about it. Number one, they're going to call him wonderful. Wonderful. Everybody say wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, this is the Hebrew word pile. Pile. It means a miracle. 
a marvelous thing. Wonderful really means full of miracles, full of marvels. There's still miracles being performed today. It wasn't just the lame man at the gate beautiful. It wasn't just the blind man. It wasn't just uh, Lazarus. It wasn't just uh, the widow of Nain's son. There's still miracles being performed today. Why? Because he is now what he always was. He's full of miracles. And there's miracles in this room. There's people sitting in this audience that know that God has worked a miracle in your life. There was some healing that came that wouldn't have come any other way there was some blessing that came there was some breakthrough that came there was some direction that came when you didn't know what else to do there was something that came that makes you know that you got a miracle from the Lord there's something that came that makes you know your family got a miracle from the Lord there's something that came and you don't have the luxury of doubt anymore people that have received miracles don't have the luxury of doubting God because God has proved himself to you time and time and and time and time and time again and he's still full of miracles he's wonderful he's full of miracles number two counselor this is this is my favorite thing about his name and it's 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 odd it's strange uh it's paradoxical but he said that people are going to say and, and they have i have many of you have but he says people are going to say this about calling on the name of Jesus in faith. Oh, somebody ought to just say, this is Jesus. He said, people are going to say, Thomas, they're going to say, when I called the name of Jesus in faith, he became a counselor. Doesn't just mean advisor or someone to listen to your problems. It also means advocate or lawyer. Am I the only one in here that got in trouble and didn't know what to do? and called on Jesus and he stepped in to become my lawyer my my defense attorney he he went to bat for me he got me out of the charges he he, he got me on deferred adjudication he got me on probation I, I deserve the whole book to be thrown at me but but he stepped in and he negotiated a deal for me he negotiated a plea deal for me if I would plead the blood he would cover me he, he stepped in has anybody been covered by Jesus <laughs> counselor Number three, the mighty God. The mighty God. Literally translated, the mighty almighty. Say it, the mighty almighty. Full of might, full of power, power that is never exhausted, power that never runs out, power that cannot fail, power that has never met a circumstance that it could not rule over. All authority and all power has been given unto Jesus. And whatever you are going through this morning, God has power over it. I'm going to say it again. I'm preaching to somebody. Whatever you're dealing with in your life this morning, God has power over it. Number four, everlasting father. The tragedy of a good father is this. Every man dies. Now, if you've had a terrible father, an, an abusive father, or a manipulative father, sometimes it can almost be a relief when they're gone. But if you had a dependable father, a father that loved you, a father that provided for you, a father that was there for you, a father that would hold your hand and wipe your tears, a father that would help get you through, then the better they are, the worse the tragedy is when they go. The difficult thing about having a good father is that they don't last. They don't last all your life. But God says they're going to say something about my name. He's going to say there's going to be people that call on it, and what they find in it is an everlasting father is on the other side of that name. A father that never dies, a father whose counsel will never cease, whose wisdom will never cease, whose embrace will never cease, a father that loves at all times, a father that never sleeps and never slumbers, a father that never ages, a father that never declines, a father that never goes through things, an everlasting 
father. And then number five, they're going to say this about his name, Isaiah said. They're going to say, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. He said there's going to be people that call on that name and find out that no storm has the power. Oh, that no difficulty has the power to stop the Prince of Peace. That Jesus brings peace into chaos. Jesus brings peace into chaotic marriages. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus brings peace into chaotic family relationships. Jesus brings peace into difficulties at work. Jesus brings peace into financial hardship and difficult, stressful times. Jesus brings peace in hospital rooms. Jesus brings peace in cemeteries. Jesus brings peace at times where there's no peace to be found any other place. But this is Jesus. Stand to your feet, clap your hands, give him praise all over the house this morning.